let's start with our next topic, uh, the role of engineer management, manager, sorry. And uh, let's uh, welcome our speakers. So, Tiago de Faria, uh, Lena Reinhardt, uh, Piogio Niero, and Oscar Fellini. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Yeah, welcome to the second year that we have a panel here in uh, Berlin. My name is Tiago. I'm going to moderate, and by that I mean I'm going to interrupt you when you're speaking too much or interrupt them, because they are the stars of the show. And I just wanted to quick start with a brief introduction from all of them, what they do, where do they work, and things like that. Hi, so I'm Lena Reinhardt, Director of Engineering at CircleCI. I lead our product engineering organization. We're a distributed company. CircleCI is around 300 people. At this point in engineering, we are roughly 90-ish. And I'm based in Berlin, but my team is distributed across the globe. And we do a fantastic product for continuous integration and delivery. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Oscar Fanelli, engineering manager at Meetup. Uh, I come from Italy. Um, I, uh, when I was in Italy, I founded a startup about uh, booking addressers. Uh, I work in Tom's hardware. Um, I love pizza. I love video games. I love astronomy. And yeah, that's it. Hi, my name is Pier Giorgio Niero. Nobody can pronounce it correctly, so the short version is PG. Uh, I am head of engineering at Super Ocean, the first kit tech company in the world. We are uh, roughly 160 people distributed globally. Uh, my team is product and engineering, 45 people, mostly based in London, but a third of them work from home in uh, different countries in Europe. And just to give the rules of the game, for the first 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to be asking them questions. They're going to discuss amongst themselves. Shout out to, to the audience what they think. I hope they have some very hairy ideas about things. And after this 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to open up for the questions from the audience completely to them. And again, rules of the game. We are avoiding uh, direct questions. So it's more for the panel itself. If you have a question about Circle CI, about uh, jobs or everything there, you can talk to Lena afterwards. Or if you want to talk about Meetup, you can talk to them afterwards. Try to ask questions that are generic for the entire panel. So to start, uh, you three are engineering managers and all of it. But how do you position yourself in the company? Like, Do you play a role more in the visionary part? Do you do the technical work? Like. What is your role as an engineering manager? Okay. So as, as director, my responsibility is very much in the strate strategic area. The way that we have engineering management structured at CircleCI is we have teams of roughly five to eight people, um, engineers, who are led by an engineering manager. And then we have a relatively traditional line management model. So several teams are then overseen by a senior engineering manager who then reports up to a VP level executive or to a director level person, like in my case. And my role is very much about longer term direction, strategic discussions, but also very much about empowering the engineering managers within my core team. So I do a lot of coaching for our engineering managers. We have an internal and as well as external resources that we use for training them. My day-to-day -day work is not technical. I do not have an engineering background myself. And my focus is much more on people, processes, helping our organization deliver, helping our teams be set up for success, know the goals that they're looking to achieve, and make sure that we have longer-term clarity on what we're looking to do and what we're expecting from them. At Meetup, the Meetup structure is quite similar to the structure that Rina just described. Um, we have engineering director, we have VPs, we have engineering managers. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more actually on the team itself. Uh, in, in Meetup uh, team, at Meetup uh, we have uh, product teams and platform teams, and in each team there is an engineering manager and engineer and an engineering lead. I'm, I'm underlining this because um, at the very least at Meetup, obviously every company conceived this as an, in a different way. The engineering manager is much much more people focused, people oriented. Uh, a bit hands-on, but not so much. I would say probably like 80%, 90% 
on people and 10% on, on, uh, on tech, on being hands on. While the engineering lead instead is much more much more tech oriented is the owner um, um, of the of the every architectural decision of the team. So in this case, um, we are um, engineering manager are following everything uh, in terms of the lifespan of, of uh, uh, every employee, every direct reports from uh, uh, hiring, recruiting to coaching um, to take care, taking care about the career growth of, of every direct report. And uh, obviously, um, everything which is related to giving feedback, uh, providing providing feedback, uh, uh, making sure that people are providing feedback uh, with each other in a, in a meaningful way, and um, and it's also the the engineering manager is also accountable for anything which is related to the roadmap. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of responsibilities which overlaps between engineering manager, engineering lead, and uh, um, uh, product managers. So for example, when we are dealing with the, the definition or, of a roadmap, uh, um, the, the effort is joined between these three, uh, between these three roles. Um, so this means that, uh, uh, yes, there are things which the engineering manager is accountable for, but uh, in, for, for many, many things, uh, uh, communication between engineering lead, engineering manager, and product manager is absolutely essential to make thing work inside the team. And obviously anything which is also related to communication cross teams uh, really, uh, outside of the team itself, but with other teams. It could be um, platform teams, that could be uh, marketing, design, and, and so on and so forth. You guys just said everything I wanted to say, so thank you. I want to add one more thing. So, well, my role is head of engineering, something very similar to what Lina does. So um, technical leadership in Super Awesome is structured in two ways. So there is the CTO that is the visionary, right? So the person who says, well, we have to build a tech to do X because that X doesn't exist and we want to be the first in the market. Hey, PG, how do we want to do that? How do we want to do it? This is really my, my role, right? So uh, I have the responsibility of putting in place an execution plan, so converting a dream into a tangible result, I would say, and enable uh, and break it down the, the the goals into digestible goals for the different teams. And if a team doesn't exist, sourcing that that team, creating a mission around that team, giving giving a you know a a direction to to that team. So that's what I do, and. A, for the structure, engineering managers, engineering leads, technical leads, what they said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, listening to all of this, it seems like there is this tech lead, but there's also this manager of managers almost, but there is also the CTO and the person responsible for the product. And it doesn't seem like there is, I even though you are describing all of it in a very similar fashion, it doesn't seem there is a unique point, like this is what an engineering manager actually has to do and it's not a common thing in all the companies. So for person, for anybody that is aspiring, I want to be an engineering manager and uh, all of it, what do you think is the path? What kind of characteristics they need to have and to build up to go into that direction? Can, can I start this time? I, I already have the mic. <laughs> so um, there is one key point that I think is the common point of the engineering managers at Super Ocean, Circle CI and a meetup, uh, people. People is the key asset in our company, in any company. Our meaning ours or yours or anybody's company. So uh, in engineering managers should focus, their primary focus is people, is making sure that people are happy, making sure that people are a good fit for what they are trying to achieve, making sure that they are growing, making sure that they are well paid, making sure that that they are there, they, they are gelling with the, with the rest of the team, making sure that there is that, ch that chemistry inside the team that enables the team to, to get to a real state of performance, I would say, state of the art of performance. So that is the role of an engineering manager. That said, some companies have engineering managers that don't code. Some other companies have engineering managers that code. Some other companies have engineering managers who are not really engineering managers because they are, I don't know, product managers who are managing engineers or something like that. There is the bottom line here that is every 
type of engineering manager eventually, co eventually uh, deals with people, right? So if you want to develop yourself into an engineering manager, the first question that you have to ask yourself is, would I be happy giving up what I do right now, product management, coding, whatever, to deal with people as my, prior, my, as my primary focus? Because if the answer is no, give up, don't go there. Here be dragons. If the answer is yes, that's going to be the best journey of your life. So, um, focusing a bit on the path itself, uh, um, I met a lot of people, which a lot of the software engineers, which thought that uh, the next step in their career was to become an engineering manager. I met a lot of amazing software engineers, which ultimately became awful engineering managers because they didn't like actually to work with people. Because, as Pedro says, it's just a totally different job. Actually, most of the time, I, I, I define myself more as a therapist than, than an engineering manager. <laughs> Um, but the, the thing is that uh, there are some people which might like working with people and other people which might not like. Uh, obviously, in order to, to be an engineering manager, you, n you need to have some background on engineering, otherwise it's not being an engineering manager. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's a different path. So um, being an engineering manager means working a lot on communication, being always one step ahead about something which might happen. And usually we are talking about problems. We're not talking about happy things. We are talking about trying to uh, prevent the problem from happening. Um, and ultimately, the problem is always about people. So we are not talking about coding here. We are not talking about developing a software which works. Obviously, we are, we are talking about making sure that uh, a roadmap is moving forward as expected because you are taking in consideration the right, um, the right engineers in order to, to solve the right problems. But ultimately, you are focusing on people. So I think um, my, my approach to this is that I think in order to understand what makes a good engineering manager, we need to first understand what makes a good engineer in order to support these engineers them properly. I think the, so I've, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of, like both engineers who transitioned into engineering management, but also with a lot of engineering managers who have no traditional engineering background. And the fundamental difference between engineering roles and engineering management is the amount of ambi ambiguity that we deal with on a daily basis. In engineering roles, typically the desire is to remove as much ambiguity as possible, get clarity, get precise tasks, work through them, reduce ambiguity from the systems you're handling and get everything into a measurable, quantifiable state and then finally close things, ship things and be done with it and then move on to the next thing. I think that's a really interesting line of work. It's not my line of work. Th my line of work is very different because the amount of ambiguity that I'm dealing with on a daily basis is large. And it's often one that can't be resolved because as Oscar and PG said, it's dealing with people. That also means that people, have, people are full of surprises, people are awesome, and people often go through a lot of challenges, maybe in their career, in their lives, and it's our role to support them through that, which also means the work is never done. Building a team is never done. Many challenges are never resolved. A roadmap may be finished, but then there's also the next thing already to tackle. And dealing with that difference, especially for people looking to move into management, can be a real difference because it also starts impacting your identity. I've seen that with a lot of engineers who moved into management and who also eventually became great managers. The difference is that you never ship anything. Like oftentimes there are days when you have no idea what you've actually done in the day because there's been a lot of work but nothing is actually resolved. And handling that can also get to the bottom of just who we are, what makes our work valuable, um, what, what makes us a valuable member of our team. And so I think figuring out if, like the other two already said, if those are the challenges that you're interested in, then if that's the case, focus on yeah, communication, learning facilitation skills, because I fundamentally believe that that's what engineering management roles are. They are about facilitation, making space for other people to be awesome and to do a great job, and about learning how to build environments in which diverse groups of people can thrive. And uh, here we are talking about different uh, perspectives on this. As an Italian that lives in London, 
an Italian that lives in Berlin, a German that lives in Germany, a Brazilian that lives in the Netherlands. <coughs> and seeing all of this and seeing all the different companies that I have worked with and all, all of the things, we know that developers and software engineers are very curious people. They like to try out new things and all of it. But at the same time, like you mentioned, you have that roadmap and you have the deliverables to the client on the side. How do you try to foster innovation on your teams? Do you have like center of excellence, dojos, or any other things that you call? Like, how do you try to do it? I start, I start. I start. Um, so Meetup, in the last one year and a half since I joined, uh, evolved a lot. Uh, we tried a lot of things. Uh, focus uh, changed quite a lot of time. Uh, at the beginning, we were doing ma many, many more hackathons than for example, what we are doing right now, uh, we, we experimented the different things. I would say that actually, um, at least at Meetup, um, the innovation was at the team level. Uh, actually here, uh, engineering managers and engineering leads played a big role in this because um, this is the thing. Uh, we can, every company has to innovate. Uh, the problem is that most of the time when you try to innovate, uh, you are doing something which is not as much impactful as it should be for the company. And ultimately, the company should grow. Like, you are there in order to work. Obviously, you are there also in order, you are there for, for growing yourself, for becoming, becoming a, a better person than what you are today. But you need also to grow your company. Um, so if you are only focusing on innovation, probably the company is not growing as it, as it should be. In this case, we solve it by provide, the company solved this by providing more tools to engineering managers and engineer lead in order to um, focus people time on something which is at the same time impactful for the company and uh, uh, useful for the, 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 the employees, the software engineers and the rest of the team. Um, and this is, was always related to a focus that uh, each team was, was working on. And we tried many different things. For example, we tried having uh, uh, days where uh, in every, every, the, the entire team was just focusing on something totally different, something which was absolutely um, against, actually, the, the current focus of the company, but uh, which was, in a way, related to something which could have an impact still on the company, in a way similar to an hackathon, which would affect the rest of the company. We tried uh, also having some days, which uh, we call it maker days, where there were no meetings at all, where people were only focused on something very specific. And during those times, they were able to experiment with something new, because actually, they gained more time by not being distracted by, by meeting. So um, there, there wasn't, I would say, at Meetup uh, a single um, ways of innovating, but this was much more discre at the uh, discretion level of uh, engineering managers and engineering lead. It's my turn. Well, uh, I think that we have to distinguish between innovation, like you pitched it, like engineers wanting to try the latest and greatest framework and uh, innovating as a product, right? So if you want to innovate as a product, I think that it boils down to the single responsibility of a person, to a maturity of the person to say, well, yes, we have to deliver on this. This is important. This is the roadmap. It's not the roadmap because somebody else is somebody else imposed this to be the roadmap, but I fully believe and I strongly believe that this is the topmost priority for me and my team. And at that point, that becomes the priority, not just for you, but for your team. And uh, uh, well, trying the latest and greatest. So uh, let's, w what we did at Super Awesome was nothing very different from what uh, Oscar pitched already. So we have pet projects Fridays, that means that every Friday you have half a day dedicated to honing your skills. Uh, in that time box, you can try the latest JavaScript framework. It doesn't mean that you have to push it to production, right? So th they are two different things. Uh, we have that. We have uh, hackathons every quarter. Uh, we have a swarm week that is a, a hack week done off-site together with the whole team once a year. So we, we have that type of occasions, that type of opportunities for everybody to try out something new. 
the thing that we are pushing for, that I'm pushing for with my team is uh, uh, if there is the opportunity to innovate and uh, uh, as a product, try to embed innovation in the product. You're already working on something that is new, that never existed before. If you, if you manage to couple the technical innovation that you care about with product innovation that can delight the customer eventually and that can provide something new and something valuable to the user, that is the goal for yourself and for your team, I would say. My two cents, yeah. So I, I believe that both of those things, so engineers wanting to try out new things and being curious, um, and also the question of innovation around the product, I believe they're both about the same thing after all, because it all boils down to a culture of learning in our company and a culture of growth and a culture of developing great things together. And I think there are a lot of small ways to instill that culture, like with any cultural shift or with anything you're trying to add to the culture you have, it becomes about small actions. And um, one thing that we do have is we have a career growth framework for engineers, it's called our competency matrix. And if you look at that matrix, it has five major sections. One of them only is technical skills. And one of another one of them is um, product thinking. And one of them is business acumen. So we do encourage our engineers to develop skills in those areas. We set OKRs as a company um, and develop those with teams and with input from engineers. And I do believe that that's a good way to connect both um, because it also means that these skills become valuable for our engineers' career growth, but also become valuable for our product. There are a lot of small, um, other small things that we do. So we have monthly engineering talks. They're called Let's Talk Engineering and are um, organized by one of our engineers. We also have an engineering book club. Um, we don't have specific like, hackathons or anything like that, but we try and instill a lot of learning in the way that we work with our teams. I also think that agile ceremonies, retrospectives specifically, are really important to make sure you continue talking about how you're doing as a team, what to improve. Um, both in how you're working together, but also in terms of then how you're doing on a technical perspective. Like postmortems are a really important part of learning for us as well. Um, we, we try to be really mindful of how we facilitate those and to not just focus on well what went wrong, but also what can we learn from this and build this again into how we um, go on about things in the future. And so I think eventually this learning and innovation is about the culture that we set and as managers like being open about things we don't know being open about what we are learning, what we're working on, and using our power to open up space for learning for others is a really important thing that I think we can do as well. Cool, and now the time for you to ask your questions. Who is the first? Uh, I cannot see, to be honest, so. Uh, I have a question. Um, my company, uh, the company I work for this year, um, introduced the role of engineering manager. And um, it was an open process with a lot of backlash. So I'm interested, um, how did the role or the position or however you want to call it enter in your respective companies? Um, can I take it? Go for it. I was the first engineering manager at Super Awesome. So two years ago, I joined, uh, everybody was reporting into the CTO, the founder of the company. First thing, first week that was in my onboarding plan was taking on the line management of everybody. <laughs> well done. I'm still there. So alive, I won. So um, the thing that I would like to share with you the things that they would like, the, the lessons learned, I would say, are is not that just because you're a manager, you are uh, better than the others. So if you have to draw an org chart, the manager is not on the top, the manager is on the bottom. The more direct reports you have, the more you have to keep them on your shoulders, the more you have to support them, the more you have to help them to develop. Uh, so, a good way of thinking about the effectiveness of a manager is, well, how well did the people reporting into you uh, develop themselves in the last six months or in the last year? Are they 
still? Are they not moving? Are they uh, rotting over time? Their scales are rotting over time. Well, hopefully not them, but the scales are rotting over time. So you, you see what I mean, right? So a manager should be uh, evaluated and assessed as a multiplier. So um, it's not that over a certain size of, of team, you need a manager to approve holidays. A manager li literally should multiply the effectiveness of a team. Uh, like a tech lead should multiply the effectiveness and the efficiency of, of a system. So it's basically the same, the same thing, the same parallel. So the question that they would have back for you are, the size of the team, what is the backlash, uh, how was the process that you put in place. So it, it's, it, I, I don't have the full context. If you want, we can talk later, I will be around, so. Um, so I've been, in many situations, I've also been the first um, engineering manager um, or in, in different roles, um, including my current one. So I was the first director we hired in engineering at Circle CI. Um, one thing that I've found is that um, figuring out yeah, what, what the backlash is about, I think that's one thing. The other thing is basically, I found that in many, especially small companies, you don't necessarily need managers. And what I've seen is often a dynamic of companies starting to grow really quickly and then starting to hire managers too late. Um, because they miss the crucial point of when that transition would be necessary. And oftentimes, the added challenge is that when you're, going, when you're scaling that quickly, you have a lot of people who move from being generalists and kind of just doing everything to keep things running to increased specialization. And especially with very engineering-centric companies, oftentimes you have a team that's largely engineers um, who have been generalists in their role themselves. And then bringing someone in who has the expertise in like, the people things that we just talked about is a very specific skill set and oftentimes can also lead to uh, questions around, well, what, what does that do to power dynamics on the team? Who makes decisions? Who has, has which insight into, into things? Um, and who gets to have a say in what's going on? And so oftentimes a lot of dynamics that I've seen in companies are around that. So it's not just about a role per se, but also about general scaling challenges that then get kind of muddled in with a specific role. Um, and so I think figuring out um, what challenges the manager is supposed to solve, but also how to set them up for success. Like you mentioned, like having, having them interview with the team, um, but also making sure that there's a 30, 60, 90 day feedback cycle with the team. There are 360 reviews where people are not just invited to like, do informal feedback, but where there are structured paths for that person to get feedback on how they're doing, I think is really important. But I understand it's a really tricky situation. Thanks, uh, Lina and PG, because I had time to think about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the thing is that um, engineering manager can be introduced in a company in, in, uh, at many different times in many different situations. And probably uh, not only your situation is, is very unique, uh, but also it will evolve with the time. So something which works now won't work in three weeks. Uh, in my case, at Meetup, I actually was lucky because uh, the Berlin department, uh, w I, I, I was there when the Berlin department was created from scratch. But at the same time, there was a New York department uh, with the HQ, which uh, had already engineering managers, which were already working with the company since a lot of years. And so uh, actually, I was able to get some help from them, some help from my peers, uh, in terms of like how to handle some specific situation, especially related to the company, or frameworks, which are really, really important. Uh, if you are not in that situation because you don't have managers in your company, because every manager is new, basically, um, probably my suggestion there would be to find a mentor outside of the company, which is something that I didn't do, and I, I, it's, I, I regret that. Uh, I, I did too, too late, probably. Uh, because from a mentor which is working outside of the company, usually you get so many insights about something which works totally differently from your company, and from those differences, usually you get uh, some, some spark in your mind which tells you, okay, maybe I should try this, or maybe I should try something different because he or she told me that that, that just doesn't work. Um, and then 
the thing that really works well is just by setting one-on-ones and with anyone, like peers, product manager, designer, CEO, CTO, whoever, whoever you can talk with, just talk with the, with the person whenever you can, because especially at the beginning, you are just you just don't know which kind of problems you are gonna try to solve. You know that you are gonna try to solve some some problems, but you don't know which these problems are, and the best way to discover them is just by talking with people. So. Um, these are my, my two cents. And now I want to damn you for asking a good question because it took a lot of insights from them. Because now I think we have time for one more question from the audience. So, yeah, really. So let's see, let's see. I see some raised hands, but it looks like the Walking Dead. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm an executive at a small startup with 12 people. And those extracurricular activities you mentioned, that's what my question is about, like book club and uh, hacker weekends and stuff. And we've been doing all of this um, a lot of the time, but it takes a lot of time away from the people who want to work. And especially at our startup, um, people are very motivated and work very long. So in the end, um, those events are not happening as often as we want to. And we have a hard time um, telling ourselves that they are actually worth our time because people want to work and get distracted actually by those events sometimes, although if we do it, we all enjoy it. So I wanted to ask, um, what is your uh, experience with how are people appreciating it? Um, how much people are actually using it or coming to those events? How do you measure the impact? And how was your impact, positive, negative or so? So what are the hard facts of why you do this and uh, what it helps? So for us, the first thing was that these weren't management mandated, but engineers came up with those. I think generally, I, I mentioned the facilitation role of managers earlier. My fundamental belief is that people have great ideas and it's mostly our role to help these ideas come to life. <laughs> and so I think for us, the first point is that, yeah, engineers came up with them, engineers drive most of them. And the attendance is not mandatory. People show up if they're interested, people watch recordings if they can't participate synchronously. I don't have hard numbers in terms of attendance rates or so. Um, and I also think the the thing with all these learning and development things is that people, first of all, need to believe that they're valuable for them. And if they don't do that, it's probably just not the right thing for them. And so what we also try is just offer a variety of alternatives. We have other people who do who take career coaching, who go to conferences, do out online training. Like not every learning thing works for everyone. And especially with small companies, I think finding joint events is really important and can be really valuable for team building. But then it's probably also about trying out, out alternatives. I also think that in terms of ROI of these kinds of things, I can't give you a specific number because I also believe that, one, these things are for culture building and measuring culture is really difficult, it's possible, but there is especially when it comes to investing in people, that's a long-term thing and fundamentally believing that we want to invest in the people in our company, we want them to stick around and we want to help them grow is about a mindset, but it's also about understanding the long-term effects. Like 52% of people quit companies and the main reason being the lack of learning and development opportunities. This is a, this is a key area where the lack, is, lack of the lack thereof, especially, has really horrible effects on tenure. So I think finding things that work is really important there. I would be super quick, uh, but we can talk eventually more later. Uh, I would actually answer your question with another question, which is: Do your company really need these events? Because sometimes, if it's a startup, actually, the environment might be so nice that for people which are working there, for people which join the company, that probably they don't need team building. Actually, I have to quote one of my, um, one of my uh, team members, which says at some point when I proposed to have a team building, they said, I'm, I'm, my team is already built. I don't need a team building. And, and, and she was actually super, super happy about what was the situation in, in the team. She was happy about what we were doing and she wanted actually to work, to just work. So actually in, in that case, I mean, team building, sackathons, offsites, all these things are nice, but sometimes just not necessary. If, you're, if, you're, if your employees are happy about what they are doing, maybe you just don't have to do. Uh, what he said and what she said, plus. Uh, let me think, because they said a lot. 
uh, I, I would say uh, y you said you are an executive in a company of 12 people. <clears throat> the question that I would ask myself in your shoes is what my company would look like in one year from now. Are we talking about 24 people? Are we talking about 12 people? The same 12 people? What the turnover will be like if I don't act now uh, and I introduce something now to increase the tenure of my people? Because if, let's say that you don't grow but you have a very high turnover and you have to spend 50% of your time recruiting people, that means that you are dedicating 50% of your time less to whatever you could have done. So this is, if you are in that situation, ask your people in a one-to-one -one setting, in a group setting, I mean, you know them more than me, uh, and uh, ask them, are you happy? Are you able to deliver uh, work on that, that makes you proud? Are you happy of how the office is? Are you happy? If there is one thing that you would change today, what, that would, do, what, what would that be? If they ask for the book club, create a book club. Give it a try. You are, uh, th there is a, a thing that I learned that is, uh, I don't know if I will pronounce it correctly, is um, it's called Kanefen. It's Welsh. Uh, basically, this guy theorized that the problems can be split in four quadrants from a, on, on the right or on the left, it depends how you draw it, actually. Uh, <laughs> you have problems that can be solved with a deterministic approach and problems that can be resolved with uh, a trial and error approach. With people, you are definitely on the trial and error. And what Oscar said earlier was, you can try something that will resolve into nothing in three weeks from now. So, but at least you gave the message to your, to your team that you are trying something. So maybe it's not the book club, maybe it's something else, but at least you gave a try to the book club. And the message that you pass is we are here to try out things and, and processes and start new initiatives to make you happy because I really care about you guys. So this is the message that you want to pass as an executive, I think. So before we go for our drinks and all of it, I want to have one last question to them. And come with me, because I'm a little bit of a geek. So imagine that you have a time machine, and then you can go back to one day before you had your first job as an engineering manager, and you have one minute to give an advice to yourself. What would you say? Me first? Me first, okay, good. Uh, one minute. So first of all, you are doing the right thing. I just have one minute with you, with me actually. So uh, I'm extremely proud of yourself. I'm extremely proud of the man and the manager that you became. Keep keep pushing hard, surround yourself with uh, the best people of the industry, be one of them eventually, keep, keep asking the right questions. No question is stupid, so all the questions are the right questions. Keep pushing hard, keep studying, and you eventually will become me. And I mean, there's nothing I can say to myself in, to, to, to teach myself something better uh, in one minute. So I will go for the pep talk. <laughs> okay. um, I would say just, just leave whatever you are doing and go on vacation because it's better doing now than later. <laughs> no. <laughs> so probably what, what I would say to myself is um, to ask yourself, hey Oscar, ask yourself if you are doing the right thing now and you are thinking to the, the, the right thing at the right moment. Um, because probably one of my uh, biggest, all the biggest errors that, uh, that I made in the past probably are related to 
uh, not thinking what is the best thing to do in that moment. Uh, and it might seem a detail. Uh, sometimes it was just a small thing, but maybe that could change totally uh, the, the, the output in the future. Uh, so prioritizing and making the right decision at the right moment, for it's, I think it's one of the most important things. And I think we should always ask ourselves if you are doing the right thing at the right moment. Um, so I got into engineering management by being a CEO and by accident. And for a long time, I wasn't sure if it was for me and if I was the right person for it, which I think are two things that I'm still wondering about. And the main thing for me was that at some point, because I have a very non-traditional background, at some point I realized that all the work that I'd been doing that had been leading me into this role was about people. And that kind of connects to what we talked about at the beginning. And so caring about people, being curious about people, getting to know them, figuring out and learning how to support them well, each of them individually, because everyone has very different needs and aspirations and dreams and things that frustrate and motivate them. And so focusing on people and then focusing on building out frameworks and structures in which people can thrive and making sure that I do my part to create an environment in which that's possible. That's been the main thing and it took me a long time to figure out that that's actually the stuff I want to do and that I care about and I'm really passionate about. And so for me, it's just eventually been about people and about continuing to not just get to know the individual people that I'm working with, but also learn how to get better at the at more abstract level of that. So understanding how people work and what organizations and teams need to thrive, how delivery is done well on teams and what makes teams very effective. Just continuing to learn that and continuing to question my own role, the power I bring and the impact that has on teams, but also being staying humble, like l using my own experience in a way that supports others instead of overshadowing them, but using that to lift them up and hopefully make a positive impact on their career. And I would like to thank first everyone for, for, for coming here. This is a developers conference. And as they mentioned, and I would like to leave as a last message, being a developer, it's less and less about coding and more and more about relationship with people and how to build the right product and being able to do that. Having an engineering manager, depending on the context on the things that you have, is all about enforcing that and trying to build a culture that gives support for the independence and also to give people the freedom to do what they like. So I'd like to say thank you for the panelists. And thank you again all, and we'll be on the drinks if you want to ask questions. So see you later. <laughs>